Well, we had been talking about uh, risk factors for uh, chronic heart disease, and, and the reason you know, we're taking this so seriously is because this is such a high-risk disease uh, for all of us, and there is so much that we can do to uh, control uh, the risk that we're at. Now, I, I had just mentioned you know, predisposing factors that, uh, that can add to our chances that uh, we will be vulnerable for heart disease. Also, there really is a complex relationship uh, between demographic variables uh, and illness. Uh, variables such as ethnicity, gender, and age are related to a tendency to overreact physiologically to stressors. Uh, for instance, uh, chronic heart disease is about half as common among Chinese or Japanese Americans as among Europeans or African Americans. Now that's a pretty big difference. You know, half as likely uh, if you are from Asia uh, in your background uh, versus being from Africa or the US. Now in contrast, high blood pressure is about twice as common among African Americans as European Americans. Uh, obviously that would tell you that just knowing that we should be checking African Americans very early in their lives uh, to see what their blood pressure is like <clears throat> because they may need some assistance. And, <clears throat> and again, diet can really influence that. Also, males, African Americans of both genders, and older people <clears throat> all suffer higher than average rates of heart disease and they have larger than average blood pressure responses to certain stressors. So if you're in one of those groups, uh, there are risk factors for you that are more intense than if you're not in those groups. Now, why these differences occur is not clear to us. Uh, but what we do know is that physical factors uh, such as diet and cultural factors uh, such as living in a stressful environment uh, seem almost certain uh, to be important contributing factors to why we have these findings in these various groups. Now then, there are psychological factors in chronic heart disease. And, uh, and, and should, I should be using coronary heart disease, but, but chronic and chronic is important in the sense that this is not something that goes away unless uh, you do things to actually improve your heart functioning. Now, during the past 20 years, the most common psychological risk factors have been grouped under what is called type A behavior. And type A behavior uh, was first identified by two cardiologists. And these people are described as displaying things like, as you'll see in, in our uh, slide here, explosive accelerated speech. These people talk fast. Uh, they seem to be in a hurry when they're talking. They have you know, a general heightened pace of living. That is, these, these people, they're always doing something, always on the go. Uh, and they're impatient <clears throat> if you're not on the go. They're they don't want things to be slow. Things have to happen now. Uh, also, there are attempts <clears throat> to perform more than one activity at a time. I mean, these people feel such a need to achieve that they're, they're trying to do all kinds of things uh, as much as they can get done in any given time period. As you might guess, of course, we've also identified that these people have a preoccupation with themselves. And if, if you're in this kind of driven state, uh, you'll find that people, these people are dissatisfied with life. And they tend to evaluate their accomplishments uh, in, in terms of numbers. So, and by that, I, I mean, like, they gotta get a lot of things done. Uh, it's not enough to get one thing done very well. These are people who have multiple tasks going at the same time, and they've gotta get them all done. Not only have to get them done, but they have to have to be better. That's why these people are competitive. 
uh, you know, they're kind of driven to, to do things uh, the very best. And we find these people have free-floating anxiety, uh, excuse me, free-floating hostility. Free-floating anxiety is another concept. Uh, who knows, by the way, what is free-floating hostility? Or what do you think free-floating hostility is? Mr. Jones? It's basically like a generalized like, hostility towards everything. I mean, it's a, it applies to everything. You're just kind of hostile. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, well, you're, the point you're making, first of all, it's generalized. It's not directed. It's, it's hostility. It just comes out. I mean, the person is so driven and, and, and therefore not satisfied because they're trying to do multiple things at one time, uh, and they're trying to do them the best they possibly can, that often you see a diffuse hostility coming out. And as you can imagine, then, th these are not you know, people you probably are looking to meet. Uh, and, and these are not people that are comfortable be, to be around. But... If you happen to work for such a person, you have got a problem. Because, you know, as you can imagine, these are not people who are easily going to be satisfied. Now, after type A was what really got people's attention, but then they had to create a type B, like as a contrast. And type B people are seen as being more relaxed. Uh, they're people who feel less time pressure. Uh, they appear less competitive, uh, less controlling. They're not hostile people. Uh, and, and it's interesting uh, because you, you find that, you know, there are, there are some people who are catapulted into situations that create stress, but they, they don't necessarily become type A people. I remember one time I was giving a, a talk to uh, several hundred alumni about stress in their lives, and, and I had an alumni panel. And one of the people on the panel described himself as a type A. And he was a person who had smoked four packs of cigarettes a day for a long period of time. Until his physician kind of threatened him uh, with all the dire consequences a physician could possibly think of. Physician did a great job. I mean, really frightened the guy. And the guy actually gave up smoking. But he didn't give up type A behavior, which became the next concern his physician had about uh, the guy was so driven. But at one time, uh, I remember him in his talk saying to people, I mean, who would want to be a type B? I mean, who would want to be relaxed? Who would want to be, uh, you know, not doing all the things that I do? I mean, the reason why I'm so successful is because I'm driven. I like being driven. Uh, and he went on. And... Part of what uh, I was struck by is that uh, this individual, in some of his drivenness, probably was getting a lot of enjoyment. In other parts of his drivenness, it was clear uh, he really wasn't aware of why he needed to do uh, so many things, why he needed to excel in this way, and that these, this was a very unhealthy uh, lifestyle. And, and I remember the, another member of the panel who was under a lot of stress, uh, was under a lot of stress, stress for a very different reason. This was a, an extremely talented uh, woman who became the first vice president in, in a multinational corporation that she was in. And uh, it had been you know, a typical old boys corporation. I mean, women simply did not become vice presidents. And she becomes a senior vice president. And, and she described all the stress that comes with that because when you're the only person in that role, as the only woman, and there never has been a woman before, you don't have a model for what to do, at least she felt that way, uh, and, and you feel that people respond to you a little differently because it's unique to have somebody in this power position and everybody else is having to make adjustments. And, and this occurred to this woman at a time when uh, we were much less sensitive to the issues uh, of gender. Uh, she was a real breakthrough person. So it created a lot of stress for her, but it didn't make her a type A personality. It just made her somebody who, uh, because of the, of the unique pressures of her lifestyle, was creating stress. Now, currently, we actually know that the relationship between type A behavior uh, in coronary heart disease is more complex than was originally believed. Uh, and in fact, 
we really don't talk much anymore about type A behavior. It's kind of a nice concept to use so you can get this picture I gave you. Uh, but some of the assumptions we made, we, we're now beginning to challenge. For instance, uh, being a type A person does not mean that you are highly likely to suffer a heart attack or some other form uh, of coronary heart disease. Uh, and, and part of that is due to the fact that uh, you, know, you have other predisposing factors and you have other complexities that, either, that may contribute to uh, why you would uh, you know, experience a coronary heart disease. For example, uh, if you think of all the things I mentioned to you about how a type A person looks, that person may not have social support. That is, people may not want to be around that person. So it becomes complex to, to sort out how much is it that this person doesn't have any social support that's contributing to the risk factors for heart disease versus this kind of intense life behavior. Now I want to talk about another uh, serious illness and what psychology uh, and other health professionals know about it and, and, and how it's developed and what's going on now. And these are risk factors for HIV AIDS. And as you know, HIV is the uh, human uh, immunodeficiency virus. So we're, we're talking about a virus and then we're talking about the actual illness that comes from the infection, namely AIDS. Now, estimates indicate that about a million people in the United States are infected with HIV. And so we refer to these people as HIV positive. Homosexual males and intravenous drug users are at the highest, highest risk. And, and they were the early people we identified. But the incidence of HIV is growing especially fast among low-income African-American and Hispanic-American adolescents. So we, we now have new groups. And we used to have almost a stereotype group of who would become infected. Now other groups are becoming infected. And I mentioned you know, a million cases in the United States. The problem is much, much worse in other parts of the world. Globally, there are 36 million people that we believe are infected with the HIV virus. And by the way, 47% of them are women. Now that's, that's really dramatic when you consider that when we first focused on HIV in the United States, uh, early it was gay males were overwhelmingly the population that we thought were at risk. But now worldwide, uh, we find that 47% uh, of the infected people are women. And 95% of all the cases of HIV uh, are in developing countries. You know, and this is where the infection has spread dramatically and our ability to create prevention programs uh, has not helped. Now, health psychologists have assisted, though, uh, really in the whole issue of AIDS by focusing attention on the fact that most cases of AIDS can be prevented by avoiding several key risky uh, factors, that is, behavioral factors. The one you certainly, because uh, I don't think you can avoid knowing about AIDS, so you know that sexual activity without the use of condoms uh, puts one in a high-risk group. Uh, the, the, I mean, and unless you know, you're only sexual with one person and you know a lot about that person, uh, if you don't use condoms, there's no question that you increase risk. Sexual contact with multiple partners and or partners with unknown sexual history is another risk factor. Now, when you think about it, if if you yourself are active or have been active, let's say, over the last two or three years with multiple partners, and then you're now involved with somebody who has been active with multiple partners, and you don't use condoms, you put yourself in the position where you have greatly increased the possibility that, uh, that you, know, you will be infected. Uh, and uh, and, and you, you do it 
uh, not knowing exactly what the risk is. As you don't know how many partners someone else has had. Or if you have had multiple partners in recent times, you don't know how many partners they have had. So you, you, you don't know what is the total population of people that perhaps could have some influence right now in this act. Now, also there are those people in which you yourself may be someone who has had very few partners and, and maybe your partners have tended to be longer term and, uh, and so, and you've gotten to know them well. But now you're in a new relationship and because uh, you know, you're someone who doesn't become sexual, let's say, with a person until you feel you have a very meaningful relationship with them and the relationship has grown to the point where being sexual really makes a lot of sense right now. Uh, it's possible that you haven't explored with the other person what their sexual history is like. Uh, and so, and, and you may be uncomfortable, after all, this is going to be the first time you're going to be sexual with them, you could be uncomfortable in asking too many questions about who they've been sexual with and what they know about those people uh, for fear that the, the person, you know, may take this as kind of an insult that they're, uh, that they're very free. Now, that's a mistake. You need to know the history of people that you are sexual with. Uh, and you need to not get frightened uh, or think that uh, you know, you're being insensitive because you ask questions. You need to think of ways to ask these questions delicately. But since the HIV virus is something we can't cure, uh, it's not something you want to take a risk of getting because once you have it, uh, your life changes very dramatically. Now we also know, uh, you know, another prevention factor. If you use alcohol or other drugs prior to, to sexual activity, often people then, you know, become less careful about the activity. Uh, you know, they become, people feel less vulnerable. Uh, they feel, what the heck, it doesn't matter right now. Uh, again, it only takes one act. Uh, Intravenous drug use, um, you know, is, is one that we, we, we know since if you're using a needle that is in common, you know, and a person shoots up and they pull the needle out of their arm, uh, there's going to be blood on that needle. Uh, and you put that needle right back into somebody else's arm, that is you're transmitting blood from one person to another person. The risk factor is huge uh, if that first person uh, is HIV positive. And there has been some good work in trying to educate people, uh, you know, intravenous drug users, about the fact that you simply don't share needles. And, and it's been unfortunate, uh, you know, in some high-risk areas where, you know, city governments and public health people have felt uh, giving out needles is, is a positive step in prevention. Like if you make needles, you know, so available, then, you know, people won't have to share needles because, you know, you can, you got a whole bunch of them. We'll just give you a whole bunch of needles. Uh, others have taken the stance that, uh, well, no, you know, you're, you're condoning, uh, you know, drug abuse. You're, you're condoning people taking illegal drugs and shooting themselves up, which is a very unhealthy activity. Uh, and so you, you, you get these, these conflict of values. The public health people would say, and I certainly would agree with them, uh, the, the reality is that this disease is so terrible, that is becoming HIV positive, uh, that you know, you first deal with keeping people from getting that disease. Then you try to deal with the next problem, which is that people are drug abusing, but you don't punish drug abusers by making them vulnerable for something that is really terrible that wouldn't have to happen. Uh, and that we know how to avoid. Then the other thing we can teach, of course, is mothers who are, that is pregnant women, who are found to be HIV positive, can be instructed that they are not to breastfeed their children because we know that the HIV virus is passed from uh, mother to child uh, through breastfeeding. And unfortunately, you know, that was something that uh, took time to discover because at first, there was the you know, feeling that the mother who was HIV positive spread the virus to the child while the child was in utero, so that the child was born uh, with HIV. Uh, or, and, and when the, the HIV didn't show up right away, 
but showed up later. There still was the assumption that it was because the mother was HIV positive uh, when she got pregnant that uh, caused this child to be HIV positive. Only, only later did we find out, actually, no, there was another reason, and that is that uh, the child actually uh, developed the virus by being breastfed. And so when we stopped that, then uh, a lot of children who might have become HIV positive didn't. Also, uh, you know, uh, newborns, of course, are uh, you know, a real uh, uncertainty for us because many children who are born of HIV positive mothers are not HIV positive. And of the children who are HIV positive, uh, some of those children cease to be HIV positive by the time they're two years of age. And we don't know why that happens. Uh, we just know that it happens. Uh, so that's the one group, uh, by the way, in which you know, there, there's, there's really some hope. Now, there also are other factors uh, that you know, we try to, uh, to deal with you know, in, in a prevention way. Even if someone becomes HIV positive, it, it is, does not mean that we stop thinking about uh, how might we prevent other things. Now, today, unlike, say, 20 years ago when we were first dealing with HIV, I mean, today there are drug cocktails a number of uh, researchers have come up with that actually seem to be very helpful. People are living much longer lives, especially seem, if they're diagnosed early and they happen to be responsive to, uh, to drugs. I mean, you know, a great public example is Magic Johnson. Uh, you know, I mean, here's someone who's a very healthy man, and he's been HIV positive for a long time now, uh, but he's, you know, leading obviously a very productive life and, and doing well. And, and what can happen to someone, and he would be a, a really typical example in some ways. You know, it's a devastating thing to find out you're HIV positive. But if you're somebody in the public eye, you know, it, it, it's even more difficult. Uh, because you feel so exposed, you can feel so raw. Now, what we discovered early with people who were HIV positive, especially in, uh, in the, when we first in mid 80s, early to mid 80s we became aware of this, most of the people who were uh, becoming HIV positive were gay males, and most of those gay males had not let it be known that they were gay. Upon finding their HIV positive, they became so overwhelmed, not only uh, because at that time it was, this was experienced as a death sentence, but also because they hadn't told their, their families didn't know this, you know, they managed to hide this for a while. People became acutely suicidal. Not only people have become acutely suicidal, uh, a number of people committed suicide. So now when you find out that someone is HIV positive, not only do you want to find out as early as you can, and not only do you want to then begin examining them to see what kinds of drugs might really be helpful to them, but you have to be very sensitive that you may have someone who is, is ready for a very serious depression. And the depression may be serious enough that they would even consider ending their life. So you in intervene with people not only because you want to medically assist them with this very serious infection, but also you want to psychologically help them because if they actually cooperate with the treatment they get, they may actually live, uh, we, we, now we have to say they may live a very long life. We have no idea how long they will live. But it's very different than it was 20 years ago where our immediate assumption was it is highly unlikely this person will live two years. I mean, that was kind of the, the standard uh, in those days. Now the standard is unknown. And as we continue to, uh, to make progress, uh, hopefully we'll find ways to cure this. But in the meantime, our, our best strategies are, first of all, prevent it. So primary prevention is unquestionably the, the major strategy. But if the person gets infected, you then have secondary preventions, like immediately trying to deal with the person so they don't become depressed, don't attempt suicide, uh, that have to take over. Now, there's, a, there's an interesting and important study on the effectiveness of different individual psychotherapies for treating depression in HIV positive patients. Uh, and I thought this was a well done study. In this study, cognitive behavioral therapists focused on helping clients restructure uh, their self appraisals. 
uh, and replace irrational thoughts, like you know, intense suicidal thoughts, with more rational ones. So that's the stance of the cognitive behavior therapists in the study. Then there were interpersonal therapists who focused on the person's mood, in a, and especially on depression. And they helped clients relate mood to their moods to environmental events and to social roles. Uh, and very importantly, the interpersonal group was trying to help people to realize you can disclose some of this. It won't be as devastating to other people as you might think. Uh, and of course, part of that is you have to come to grips yourself with not being uh, totally devastated. Then there was supportive therapy, which involved uh, a client-centered kind of therapy, but it had a, an educational component focused on depression. And again, depression was such a common, is such a common uh, symptom that this uh, intervention actually had an educational component to kind of describe depression and told people what they might do. Then there was a fourth condition, and it was supportive psychotherapy, just like I described, plus amipramine. So you had four conditions. Now, a reduction in depression occurred in all four of these kinds of therapies. But reductions were significantly better for interpersonal therapy and supportive therapy with medication. Those two interventions were superior to the others. Now, we also have focused uh, with HIV on education. And there have been really sophisticated programs developed that uh, I briefly mentioned before for children from, from K to right through grade 12. Uh, and and it's, it's striking uh, that uh, with the seriousness of the problem, we still have difficulty getting this into the public schools. Uh, the first school system that I know of, and it, not, not necessarily the first school system where it happened, but just in terms of my knowledge, was the, the Catholic school system in Chicago actually put in a system of teaching children, starting with K right through 12, about the HIV virus and about steps that they should take to be aware of it. And, and the people who put together the curriculum were able to do it in a very sensitive way so you could teach children. And the feeling was that this was such a, the, at that time, the then cardinal in Chicago who has now died, but he, he was so focused on uh, you know, wanting to prevent this. And he also had a high tolerance for, uh, you know, for deviancy and felt that uh, just because the, the, his church might not feel positive about a lot of the activities that people engaged in was no reason not to educate people about how to avoid uh, you know, this. So that was the, the first uh, school system and, 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 uh, and teachers readily uh, accepted that this was a necessary thing to do. In spite of that, there, when you're talking about you know, intravenous drug use, and you're talking about homosexual activity, uh, a lot of school systems simply don't want the kids hearing anything about that. So our most powerful intervention, perhaps, that is education, uh, is limited because of cultural norms. Now, there are some things uh, that I want to mention about uh, treatment and prevention uh, that health psychologists uh, engage in because they're, uh, they're just so important. Type A behavior, for example, that we described, uh, that, that obviously leads to unhealthy stress, can be reduced. Among the, the, the many activities available, for example, we know that relaxation training, uh, self-monitoring, uh, and training in coping skills appear to have the largest effect on reducing unhealthy, stressful behavior. Okay, so we, that we know. Then, it's okay to take this down. There are other important interventions uh, to assist with prevention. For example, counseling people on the importance of changing diet exercising regularly, and ending smoking, as well as adhering to prescribed medications are, are all important. Uh, if, if people will do those things, people will be healthier. I might mention, by the way, you know, I brought smoking up a number of times. 
Uh, you know, one of the, the first really successful smoking cessation programs was actually developed right here uh, at the University of Houston. And in the psychology department, Dr. Richard Evans, many, many years ago, started a smoking cessation program, highly researched program, to, uh, to determine you know, what really is effective in, in general in working with people. Now his focus uh, originally, of course, was in working with people already smoking. Uh, now, over in educational psychology, we have people who have developed uh, smoking cessation programs and they're working with youngsters and they've targeted uh, a lot of the Hispanic youngsters who are in school systems in South Texas and they're really trying to, uh, to bring programs in that will help them to either not start smoking or if they're in the early stages of, you know, kind of experimenting uh, to get them to stop. But the University of Houston has really been a national leader in creating, uh, you know, smoking cessation programs. Now, the extent to which patients adhere uh, to medical advice and treatment regimes is called compliance or adherence. Big, big issue. Non-compliance in taking prescribed medications may occur in up to half of patients who have medications prescribed for them. And, and especially this may occur at least part of the time. And and it's estimated that adolescents may take medications not as prescribed in about 80% of the cases. And now if you think about that, that's, a, that's huge. And this is a real dilemma for physicians. I mean, you know, you, you get an expert physician who correctly diagnoses a problem. He knows that in order for th this problem to get better, somebody needs to take a certain medication. And he or she prescribes a medication, the, the best medication, and they prescribe exactly how the person should take it. The problem is most people don't take it, most, at least half, don't take the medication the way the physician said it should be taken. And, uh, and that you know, has led us in, in educating physicians today uh, when they're going through you know, learning interviewing and learning prescribing, et cetera, to talk with them about the fact you probably have to take more time to be sure that somebody understands exactly what you're saying. Now, that, this is not uh, you know, easy sometimes for physicians who, first of all, are very busy and have a lot of pressures to get on to see the next person. Plus, you know, you say to yourself, I mean, how much time can I spend and how much does it take to get someone to understand you take one of these pills twice a day? Seems fairly common. Uh, and you would think, you know, somebody ought to be able to understand the concept. You're ill. I'm giving you this medication. Well, what, what happens, you know, with some people is, let's say they, they may need three medications to deal with their, and one of them may be three times a day, and one may be once a day, and, and one may be uh, when you get up and when you go to bed. Uh, and patients sometimes, you know, develop irrational beliefs, like even though the physician has said, you need all of these. Uh, you find that people like taking the green pill better than these other two. Or they don't like this one pill because it's so big. Uh, or they, they, they react to things like that. And as a result, they don't take things exactly the way they should. Or they may develop some belief that the green pill works better. I really, I really I'm getting better is the green pill seems to be the one that works the best. They have no way of knowing this since they're taking all these pills. But suddenly the person starts taking more of the green pill, skipping the big pill. Uh, there are all kinds of studies that show that people engage in these kind of activities uh, much to the frustration of the person who did the prescribing because the, uh, it is necessary uh, to take the pill as prescribed if you're really going to get uh, results. And, and you, you would be amazed at how resistant uh, some people are. I, I was thinking of a situation in which when I was at uh, a big medical school, the chairman in medicine calls me one day and says, I'm sending this patient to you and I really want you to see him right away. And, uh, and he describes the patient as a, a very successful uh, man who uh, 
was uh, had very, very life-threatening asthma. Man was fairly young. He was very successful in his business, very likable, and uh, the uh, the physician was prescribing a medication that the man had become frightened of, just because he'd heard about it. it was prednisone was the was the drug, and uh, so the man comes to see me and. Uh, you know, and I listened for a while, and, and the chairman of medicine had told me, by the way, this man will die shortly if he does not take this medication. But if he takes the medication, I, the chairman in medicine, feel this man will live a long life. That is, we can control his asthma, but he's got to take this medication. He's got to take the dosage I'm prescribing, which was fairly high at that time. Well, when I, when I talked to the man, uh, after a while, uh, I began realizing, gee, the guy has social support. I mean, he describes a family life that I, I trusted probably is, he's probably describing it fairly accurately. Uh, he is d doing fine at work. And I started asking him about, you know, why don't you take this medication? And, and he didn't know. You know, he, I mean, there was pro certainly some dynamic in his life, which I did not discover, that was contributing to the fact that for some reason he wasn't taking this. Partially, I felt, because he was very frightened to admit that he was vulnerable to dying. And somehow, by not taking the medication, that was his way of denying that he really might die. So after a while, you know, I, I said to him, do you know who I am? And he says, oh, yes, I know you. He says, you're the chairman in psychology in the medical school. And, and I said, and what problem do you have? He says, well, I, I have this terrible asthma problem. I said, well, why do you suppose you're seeing me? He says, well, you know, Dr. Patterson said I should see you because I won't take this medication. So I'm trying to think of, well, what will I So I said to him, do you know who Dr. Patterson is? Oh, yes, he's the chairman in medicine. I said, well, actually, he's probably the world authority on your problem. Uh, and he is very concerned about you. I think that's evidence of the fact that, you know, you're in my office and he really wants to help you. And you seem to have two choices. You can take the medication that he's trying to, that he's prescribed for you. And actually, do you realize you will do fine? He said, well, I hadn't thought about it like that. And I said, then do you realize if you don't take it, you're really at risk to have your life end. And he said, well, I, I don't want that to happen. So we talked a little longer and I and, and so I said to the man, I think that, you know, you need to take into consideration that all of us really want you to do well. You're doing well in your job. You're doing well in your family. You will do well with your illness if you simply cooperate. Well, anyway, I get a call from, from Roy Patterson a couple of weeks later. He says, what did you do with this patient? And I said, well, I kind of threatened him. I kind of told him that he's had two choices. You know, he can live or he can die. And he said, says, and that worked? And he says, how often are you seeing him? I said, I saw him once. He said, I can't believe this. He said, the guy came in today. He said, and I ran a whole bunch of tests. He said, the guy's dramatically improved. He's taking the medication exactly as I prescribed it. He is a model patient. He is doing well, and he loves you. He said, I thought you must be seeing him a lot. I says, no. I said, I think I caught him in that one moment where he could actually listen to the idea that there was a real threat for him and that he could escape the threat. And he finally heard that what you are doing for him is what needs to be done. And then later on, uh, we followed up on this man for a couple of years. And the man did, did just fine. And I always used to think back about the fact that it, if he didn't have a physician who was so sharp that he realized, I'd better send this person to a psychologist because I am not able at this stage to get across what I think needs to, to be gotten across. Uh, although uh, this was the, the, the uh, physician was a very psychologically caring person, but somehow this person just wouldn't listen to him. He makes the referral, the man goes on to lead a productive life. Without that referral, and, and maybe if it hadn't been that we're talking about a big medical center where it's easy to make these kind of referrals, you might have had a very productive man who simply because he got magical in his thinking and thought if he didn't take his medication, he probably would live, actually would have died. Now, there's, there's an interesting, actually, uh, section in your book 
where the authors actually discuss non-compliance. And, and they note that the miscommunication between physicians and patients is a very regular occurrence. And in fact, they quote a study that showed that five minutes after seeing a physician, uh, general practice patients, that is someone who is seeing a primary care physician, and, and therefore they come into a physician with all kinds of illnesses, but that 50% of these people, within five minutes of seeing a physician, had forgotten what the physician told them to do. Now you really think about that. I mean, that, that, that's a staggering statistic that 50% of people actually forget what they're told, uh, you know, by their physician. And, and I really, you know, want to point out that so often uh, with people, uh, people don't listen to the experts. That is, almost everybody tends to think of themselves as an expert. And, and health psychology has been working very hard to try to get people to understand that, first of all, you should see experts. Secondly, you should listen to what they say. And that's really how you, know, you will improve. So, uh, and this, this same uh, physician, Roy Patterson and I actually did a study. We did, it was an anecdotal study about people who take prednisone. Now prednisone is a very powerful drug. Uh, and, and it's used with uh, potentially fatal asthma. Uh, and and it's, it can be very effective. I mean, with people who have potentially fatal asthma, if they take prednisone, uh, they will be fine. If they don't take prednisone, they may die. And also with idiopathic anaphylaxis, which is another illness, uh, prednisone has been found to, to be very, very helpful. Now, there, it does have possible side effects, uh, but they tend to not happen very often. Uh, but some people have a, a mineral loss from their bones, so they uh, develop osteoporosis. Uh, there are people who have bone fractures. Uh, some people retain a lot more water when they take this drug. Uh, in a very small number of people, there is an increase for the possibility they'll develop uh, diabetes. And also, and this one is important, that there's an increased tendency for infection but, but it doesn't happen to many people. But that is a possible side effect. Uh, the, the other side of this, and, and this is, of course, the powerful side effect, like the case I described, if you don't take the drug, you probably will die. So there's a pretty high motivation to take the drug rather than to undergo, and, and to take the risk of some of these side effects, rather than to undergo the opposite, which is if you don't take it, uh, you know, you really may suffer a very, very severe uh, reversal and perhaps death. Now, we looked into why don't people take this drug? I mean, here you've got this wonderful physician uh, who has done all kinds of research. Uh, uh, Wright Patterson, for example, who was the chairman of medicine, had published over 700 articles. I mean, this is not somebody who took research lightly. Uh, and he had looked into this, and uh, you couldn't be going to a better person if you had this problem. And, but we sat down and we started asking, well, what happens? Uh, and we found that people develop what we call prednisone phobia. And prednisone phobia simply meant that the person was, uh, seemed to experience a lot of anxiety over taking this drug. Anxiety that was way beyond what the research literature would say. You know, for example, I just mentioned to you some of the side effects. Those side effects are not that horrible uh, in themselves. That is, they don't happen that often. But even if they happen, uh, they happen in a, a very small number of people. But if they happen to you, I mean, you can live with them. Whereas the other side of this coin is if you don't take the medication, you die. Uh, so we, we looked at uh, a number of patients who were non-compliant. And we began asking, you know, like, what happens with them? We found that there were, uh, so we developed uh, four categories. One was interpersonal. What we, what we learned is that some people don't take the medication because other people tell them that, you know, and socially, prednisone, is a, you don't want to take prednisone. That's a serious drug. It has all kinds of side effects. Uh, it's very powerful. Uh, you ought to go see somebody else. Uh, and so there, there was a lore for a while just among uh, so-called sophisticated, educated people, that maybe you should not take this drug. Uh, and of course, 
Rarely did a patient tell their friends, by the way, you know, my physician told me, if you don't take this drug, you, know, you may die. So people did not take it. Then we found a group we called bibliophilic. Bibliophilic referred to people who read about the drug. And we had some patients who had read the physician's desk reference. Are you familiar with the physician's desk reference? How many of you know what that is? Okay, several of you know what that is. That's the book that lists all the drugs that are prescribed by physicians. And one of the things they have to do in the physician's desk reference is they have to tell you all of the possible side effects. And often they're reporting side effects that may have occurred in a single patient. But the, you know, in, in the sense of being honest, they list all the possible side effects that some research seems to have established uh, or some side effect that's been reported that would seem to be due to this drug. Well, we found that amongst some people who went and read about prednisone, and you read this long list of possible side effects, that caused people to stop taking it. Uh, none of the side effects, again, were as serious as the illness the person already had. But that's what happened. Then we found with kids, we wonder why don't kids take the drug? Because we had asthmatic children who really needed to take prednisone and, uh, and would do fine, and in fact, tolerated the drug well. And we found out it was because their parents had talked to people about it, and the parents thought this was a dangerous drug. So the parents take their kid off a life-saving drug, thinking that they're helping the kid. Then the last one we found was we, we labeled iatrogenic, which refers to the fact that there were physicians who were not knowledgeable enough about this drug, and they didn't like prescribing it. So they either prescribed, and the most common thing was they prescribed too weak a dosage for it to be effective because they realized it, it was a very powerful drug and they didn't want to engage in, in prescribing something uh, that, uh, you know, in, in very large dosages that they thought might have side effects. The problem was for some patients, if you didn't take it in this large dosage, you wouldn't get better. Now, this kind of compliance uh, issue then uh, is more complex than, than one might think of right at the beginning. Uh, for example, uh, since patients are very anxious when they see their physicians, uh, you know, they may not listen as carefully as they should. In fact, if 50% if of people can't remember what the physician said five minutes after they saw the physician, there must be some variable operating in there, and we think it may be anxiety. Uh, also, uh, we find that the very fact that people think they're ill causes them to become non-compliant. That is, they get into this magical thing, if I don't take the medication, then I'm not ill. Uh, or they don't, if I don't follow whatever regime for treatment the physician has prescribed, I may think I'm not ill. Uh, also, so we, we get people who report back, I forgot what the person told me to do. Uh, and finally, you know, the, this issue I've been uh, saying to you a lot has been this problem that in managed care, uh, especially if physicians are seeing lots of patients, uh, they probably don't take uh, enough time with every patient. Uh, they're under too much pressure to, to take all the time that's needed. And also, you know, if you're a physician and you're, you're you know, a really articulate person, you feel, I've explained this really clearly to this person. It's difficult then to say, well, I'm going to explain it again, and I'm going to explain it again. But the reality of this is that many of the issues we're talking about in coronary heart disease occur because people don't listen to the best education we give them, to the best advice they get from uh, health care givers, and they listen too much to people uh, sometimes who aren't knowledgeable. Well, that just gives you a little feel for some of the issues in health psychology. And we're going to move on next to forensic psychology.